This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh. Well, let me extend a warm welcome to this series of Gifford Lectures at the University of Edinburgh for the session 2008 to 2009. My name is Stuart Brown, and I am Professor of Ecclesiastical History and Deputy Convener of the Gifford Lectureships Committee. We're particularly fortunate this year to be meeting in the elegant surroundings of the historic St. Cecilia's Hall, built in, in 1763 and the oldest purpose-built music concert hall in Scotland. As is customary, let me say a few words about the historic Gifford Lectures before I introduce our speaker. The Gifford Lectures were established in 1885 by a gift from Adam Lord Gifford, a justice of the Court of Session and a man of broad cultivation and learning. Lord Gifford was committed to promoting a theistic interpretation of the universe. And he endowed a series of public lectures at each of the four older Scottish universities, Edinburgh, St. Andrews, Glasgow, and Aberdeen, for, quote, promoting, advancing, teaching, and diffusing the study of natural theology in the widest sense of that term, or in other words, the knowledge of God and the foundation of ethics and morals. The first Gifford Lectures were delivered in 1888, and they have become one of the world's most renowned lecture series for theological and philosophical inquiry and reflection. Past Gifford Lectures have included such figures as Edward Caird, William James of Harvard, John Dewey, William Temple, Arnold Toynbee, Albert Schweitzer, Karl Barth, Reinhold Niebuhr, and Iris Murdoch. Our Gifford Lecture for 2008 to 2009 brings added luster to this list. She is Diana Eck, Professor of Comparative Religion and Indian Studies, and Frederick Wortham, Professor of Law and Psychiatry and Society at Harvard University. Professor Eck was born in the western Big Sky State of Montana. She was educated at Smith College in Massachusetts, Benares Hindu College in India, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, and Harvard University, where she earned her doctorate in the comparative study of religion. A distinguished scholar teacher at Harvard, Professor Eck is a member of both the Department of Sanskrit and Indian Studies, and the Faculty of Divinity. Since 1991, she has led a research project at Harvard to explore the new religious diversity of the United States and its meaning for national life. This pluralism project, which involves a number of affiliate colleges and universities, has been documenting the growing presence of the Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, pagan, Sikh, Jain, and Zoroastrian communities in the United States. Professor Eck is the author or editor of a number of critically acclaimed books. These include Darsan, Seeing the Divine Image in India, 1981, Benares, City of Light, 1982, Speaking of Faith, Global Perspectives on Women, Religion, and Social Change, 1987. Encountering God, a Spiritual Journey from Bozeman to Benares, 1993. And A New Religious America, How a Christian Country Has Become the World's Most Religiously Diverse Nation, 2001. As well as a distinguished scholar of Indian religion and women and religion, Professor Eck is also a public intellectual of the highest order, helping to reshape public attitudes and policies in the United States and to promote religious and cultural engagement in the wider world. 
In 1996, Professor Eck was appointed to a State Department Advisory Committee on Religious Freedom Abroad, which advises the Secretary of State on enhancing religious freedom within the overall context of human rights. In 1998, she received the National Humanities Medal from, from President Clinton and the National, National Endowment for the Humanities for her work on American religious pluralism. In 2002, she received the American Academy of Religion Martin Marty Award for the public understanding of religion. In 2005 to 2006, she was president of the American Academy of Religion. She is currently chair of the Interfaith Relations Commission of the National Council of Churches. Professor Eck's series of six Gifford lectures are entitled The Age of Pluralism and they will explore religious diversity in the context of the massive world migrations of peoples and the emergence of new cultural landscapes. It is a subject of immense importance and highly appropriate for our Gifford series. The lecture this evening will be recorded and will be available online on the Gifford website. Allow me also to mention that following this evening's lecture, there will be a reception to mark the beginning of the series in the stairs in the lay hall down below. Everyone present this evening is warmly invited to the reception. Professor Eck, could I now invite you to present the first of your Gifford lectures on the subject of globalization and religious pluralism? Thank you for that introduction. It is really a great pleasure personally for me to be here for these lectures and also an honor to my university. Thank you. This has special significance for me too because one of the first of the Gifford lectures was really the father of the field of study that I pursue, Max Mueller who in many ways in his work at Oxford did the most pioneering work in Indology. At the time of his Gifford lectures, he had been editing the Sacred Books of the East, bringing to English-speaking Western audiences the treasury of the world's religious texts. He also had a special expertise in the religions of India, and he was the primary translator of the Rig Veda in that Sacred Books of the East series. A few years ago, one of my graduate students got together and prepared a trivia game of Indology. And one of the questions that we had was, what year did Max Mueller first arrive in India? It was a trick question. The answer was, he never went to India. His view of the Hindu tradition derived primarily from the important texts that he studied and was quite uncomplicated by the multitudes of temples and pujas, people and gods and images of the gods, the festivals and the pilgrimages that I encountered as a student when I first arrived in India and that have been the subject of most of my Indological work ever since. And of course it goes without saying that the England in which Max Mueller lived in Oxford was much more homogeneous than the multicultural world of today's UK with its Hindu temples and its Islamic centers, large and small, its Sikh gurdwaras and Jain societies. All of these traditions he knew and could know, really, only from a distance. These lectures take up the trajectory of this enormous change in the religious currents of the West, and indeed, the entire world over the past century, and especially during the past few decades. One of the great engines of that change has been the massive migration of people from one part of the world to another as immigrants, as economic migrants, as refugees. Migration has literally changed the map and the religious demography of nations and of neighborhoods. Tamil Hindus have temples in Strasbourg and Bern. Gujaratis, like the global uh, Swami Narayan movement, have built huge temples in Neesden outside London and in Chicago and Houston. Muslims have put on get out the vote campaigns in Detroit, Michigan, very involved in the last election. And they gather in mosques and storefront Islamic centers and prayer halls across the face of European 
and American cities. Sikhs litigate for their right to wear the turban in France or carry the kirpan in Canada. And Christians, Jews, and Muslims, secular people as well, whether in France or Sweden or the Netherlands, encounter these new neighbors with a wary uncertainty. Now, along with migration, the twin engine of this fast-paced change has been the globalization of communications that has made virtual connections across seas and continents almost instantaneous. Even for those who don't venture across the metaphorical street, religious teachings, scriptures, books are more widely dispersed than ever before, and religious discourse is on the radio or powered uh, by the internet. It's in the news, on television. In January of this year, the Vatican launched a YouTube site powered by Google Italia that makes clips of Pope Benedict XVI's homilies and liturgies and speeches available in multiple languages all around the world. And meanwhile, Sheikh Karadawi in Qatar has a popular television st show on Al Jazeera in which he issues uh, statements on Sharia and fatwas in response to questions that are submitted electronically from all over the world. So propelled by these twin engines of migration and global communications, our daily encounters with religious and cultural difference are more pervasive, especially in the West, than ever before. We rub shoulders with one another. We share the same workplace in many cases. Our children go to the same schools. We eat one another's food. But very often, we know all too little of one another's faith and religious practice. So how do we navigate the swift currents and the white waters of our religious differences and of fast-paced religious change in our world, a world in which we live in greater proximity to one another than ever before? We open the daily papers, we listen to the nightly news, we know full well how religious ideas, religious communities, uh, religious sects, religious leaders and visionaries and religious fanatics are all part of the ferment. Contrary to expectations, religious faith has not disappeared in the onset of post-enlightenment secularism. Despite the predictions that somehow religion would wane as science answered more and more questions about the workings of the universe, it seems not to be the case. Human religiousness is not really simply about answering questions, puzzling questions about how the clock works, but rather about the meaning of life and death and the communities of connection that sustain us. And despite the expectation that religion would and should somehow become a more private affair, what happens on weekends or at home, we see more public voicing of religion in many parts of the world. Some who conduct the affairs of state have begun to speak of knowledge of religion as, quote, the missing dimension in foreign policy. Former American Secretary of State Madeleine Albright once confessed to having scribbled often on the margins of her briefing papers, learn more about Islam. <laughs> Indeed, today we are beginning to speak of a post-secular age, of the return of religion, if it ever was gone. And the energies of faith seem to be enduring today. Uh, sometimes people speak of themselves as spiritual, but not religious. Sometimes that spirituality has been nurtured in a Christian Sunday school, but then brought to flower by Buddhist vipassana meditation. And some of the energies of faith are channeled into what we might call secular NGOs by people who are not so sure about religious institutions, but are very sure about religious ethics and the AIDS pandemic or education for girls or human rights for all people. So I call these lectures the age of pluralism because religious faith and religious difference is one of our great planetary issues. How do we human beings relate to one another across the various divides of culture and religion? That's an important question. It's important for those of us who study religion, as I do. It's important for those of us who don't study religion but are citizens of increasingly multi-religious cities. And it's an important question for those of us who are people of faith whether Christian or Muslim or any other faith. First, let me say that in studying religion, this age of pluralism 
is a challenging one. How do we reach into the complexity of this new world? How do we study the kinds of multi-religious encounters and intersections that I have come to think of as pluralism? There are certainly historical precedents for our time, times when what we came to call the religions did not flow neatly within borders, when religious movements were entwined in a common context. I think of Buddhist monks arriving in China in the second and third century, for example, encountering Confucian and Taoist traditions, and a whole new cultural complex began to emerge. Or I think of Mughal India, currents of what we now call Muslim or Hindu or Sikh devotional traditions all flowing together and developing in relation to one another. Or medieval Spain, where Muslims, Jews, and Christians lived and flourished together in what came to be called the Convivencia, in Toledo, in Cordoba, in Andalusia. My own teacher, Wilfred Cantwell Smith, was a lifelong critic of the all too solidly conceived religions, which some scholars persist in trying to tame and study and arrange in separate book chapters as if they could be studied separately, which they can't. Uh, he was especially drawn to those complex places in human history. And he did not often use the term pluralism, but there was much in these historical interrelations of cultures and peoples that provides precedent for the more intense forms of encounter that we see today. But hear this. As scholars, we live today in a world as rich with the immediacy of profound cultural encounter. The living laboratory of the convivencia is at our doorstep. Boston is Toledo. Birmingham is Toledo. A new reality is unfolding before our eyes, and to study it requires a new kind of curiosity, an ability to look carefully at the local and translocal nature of interreligious encounter. And I'm recruiting scholars to do this because I think it is very important scholarly work. But the age of pluralism is not just a challenge for scholarly study. It's also a challenge for citizens in the nations and cities where our co-citizens are people of many faiths. How do we, whoever we mean by we, live and work together out of the depths of our differences? That is a challenge of the age of pluralism. For many societies in Asia, that challenge began with the colonial experience and its aftermath, whether in India, in Indonesia or Malaysia. And that began for many of us in the West with the migration of people, some of them from those former colonies. Religious traditions long at home in India put down roots, new roots in the UK and now more recently in the US. This religious diversity is both potentially creative and also problematic. All sorts of issues, headscarves, sharia, education, mission, con conversion are on the table. And even for ardently secular people, and there are quite a few of them, who have no personal use for religion at all, this new situation demands the attention that comes with citizenship. These issues are not just theoretical issues. They will not go away, but they're grounded in the everyday living context of our civic life. These are the workshops where our future is being built. And I'll talk about that tomorrow and on Thursday of this week. And then there's a third context in which we encounter this challenge of the age of pluralism, and that is in our communities of faith. Here we're challenged to take stock of our own faith in the presence of so many others. Scholars may study these encounters, mayors and judges may wrestle with them in the context of our civil society, but those of us who are people of faith, we have our own work to do. How do we as Christians or Muslims or Buddhists understand the faith, the truth, the path of the religious other. Religious life today is lived everywhere in an awareness of multiple frames of faith, an awareness that one's neighbors, whether around the world or across the street, do not share the worldview that we have. For some, this awareness may be frightening and destabilizing. And for others, it may launch an exploration of religious meaning that takes us into a deep appreciation of the faith of others, perhaps to reflective interpretation of our own faith. Do we pray to the same God? Can we pray together? 
I'll go into these questions next week. These lectures are cited then in the many contexts in which religious pluralism is on the agenda. The global context of a world increasingly without borders, the national context of multi-religious societies, the local context of our cities and towns. And then I turn to the communities, whether Christian, Muslim, or Hindu, where we engage with these questions in our religious language, the language of our faith. And finally, I address the pluralism within, that religious diversity and difference is not simply something that's out there, but a matter of our own inner geography as well. To say something of the worlds within me, India and America would be two of the primary worlds. When I first went to India to study Hinduism, the migration uh, of peoples and the instantaneous global communications were, alas, uh, far on the horizon, did not yet exist. Air letters still took 10 days at least to get from Benares to Boston, and a telephone call was somewhere between difficult and impossible. That was 1965. It was the same year that the Immigration and Nationalities Act was passed in the US, opening the door to immigration from Asia. Before long, Indian trained doctors were migrating to American cities. And from the standpoint of India, we called it the brain drain. But I had not yet begun to imagine what it meant from the standpoint of America. Since then, India and America have become entwined in one another's histories. The immigration of the past 40 years has created a living bridge between India and America, a constant two-way traffic. Parking tickets in New York might be processed in the Kulu Hills, or call centers in Bombay answer questions from credit card customers in Illinois, or Indian scientists in California check the cricket scores on their cell phones. South Indian, Tamil, and Telugu Americans consecrate temples in Nashville and Kansas City. They import sacred images from the artisan workshops of Mahabalipuram. They fly home to Chennai for a family wedding. The Gujaratis hold their garbas in a big New Jersey hotel. American Hindus recreate the festivals of Diwali in Salt Lake City and Cleveland. And last year, for the first time in history, in my hometown, in Bozeman, Montana, a Diwali celebration. Hindu American Foundation, which is an advocacy group for Hindus, has pressed the government to issue a Diwali stamp. And it has also kept a close eye on Hindu civil liberties in America, just as the Sikh coalition documents civil rights abuses against Sikhs and meets with the National Transportation Safety Board over issues of turbans and kirpans on the airlines. Ours is a world of increasing connections. It was in the early 1990s that I began to feel the ground under my own feet as an academic shift as the religious communities I had studied in India became more visible in the United States. I launched the Pluralism Project at Harvard University in 1991. And for more than 18 years now, we have engaged students and colleagues in research on this dynamic life. We've studied individual temples and mosques and gurdwaras, doing some of the own, only micro-histories of these communities that have been done. We've asked how these traditions have changed and adapted in the American context as they become nonprofit corporations and have to elect officers and have their own elections and competition, et cetera, the great American leveler of elections. And we've asked how America is changing as we, the people, become more complex? Where are the tensions and fault lines, the ugly stereotypes, the hate crimes? Where are the new connections? Where are the interfaith initiatives? The Pluralism Project has become what one scholar of religion characterized as the study of globalization and religious pluralism from the ground up, beginning with the local. So let me say a word. What is pluralism? We should at least ask that question, and I'll give you a quickie answer. First, that diversity and pluralism are not the same thing. Diversity is a fact of our societies and of our communities. Pluralism is a response to diversity, an engagement with it. And second, pluralism is not simply tolerance. Tolerance doesn't require us to know a thing about one another. It does nothing to remove our ignorance. 
It leaves in place some of the old stereotypes and half-truths and fears that we have carried with us for a long time. And in the world of proximity in which we live today, we need something a bit more active than tolerance. And pluralism also is not easy relativism, seeking the lowest common denominator, trying to sign at the bottom line, at the bottom of the page. Pluralism is really the encounter of our commitment. It means holding our differences, our deepest differences even, even our, uh, the things that we think of as absolute, but not in isolation, holding them in relation, in conversation, in mutual understanding with one another. It's not about eliding difference. Of course, there are other responses to our religious and cultural difference. Exclusion, for example. Speaking as an American, our immigrant society has gone through a lot of chapters of exclusion. There were too many Irish Catholics. There were too many Jews. This was in the 19th century. There were also too many Chinese. We drew the line there. The 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. And those policies of Asian exclusion continued deep into the 20th century. We know, all of us, the impulse to build walls thick and high enough to protect the insiders and keep out the others. We see it even today. But in a world that is swirling with movement, we also suspect that this kind of exclusionary stance, this kind of tribalism, will not be, be viable. And there are not only social exclusions, but also religious and theological exclusions. We know about those. Speaking as a Christian, I know there are many Christians historically and today for whom the religious other, the non-Christian, is excluded from the salvation of the one we call God. And we'll come back to that next week. Inclusion or assimilation is another response to diversity. Including the other under the umbrella of our own world on our own terms, in our own language, in the structures, in the nations we have already built, that have been made by us, whomever we are. Our own lives need not be changed or chal challenged. And especially when there's a large majority community, as Christians in America or Muslims, for example, in Indonesia, the dangers of an inclusive stance or an assimilative consciousness often include the effective eclipse of the voice of the other or the agency of those who are supposedly included. Pluralism is not the melting pot where our differences disappear, but the orchestra in which all of us together create something new. We had those two images in America in the early 20th century. Israel Zangwill, the famous poet who wrote a play called The Melting Pot, and in the mouth of his hero, uh, looking out at Ellis Island and seeing all the Europeans lined up there, said, into the crucible with all of you, God is making the American. The melting away and shedding of difference as a way of conceiving who we are. But it was another Jewish sociologist, Horace Callan, uh, in the late 19-teens, who said, wait a minute, this is not even American or democratic to think that you have to shed your differences to participate in the common covenants of citizenship. And he took issue with this and said, pluralism is really the encounter of our differences. And he was the one who used the image of the orchestra, that pluralism is about the integrity of that encounter and the orchestra an image to describe the relatedness of our society. Pluralism requires something of everybody, of all of us. We all change. And that can be frightening because, as we know, change is frightening. I'll never forget one woman who observed the building of a new Jane summer camp in a wooded area at the end of her road in New Jersey. I'm not a prejudiced person, she said, but I just don't want things to change. And that, of course, is precisely our problem in the world it's a tough issue. We're not prejudiced, but we don't want things to change. And in a dynamic world of religious change, that's a problem. As we think about this new era of global encounter and religious pluralism, I want to go back now to another global moment 100 years ago, the world's parliament of religions, and then another global moment just 16 years ago, the centennial of that parliament, and then fast forward to today. What do we mean when we use this word global? 
Come to Chicago with me in 1893, where the World's Parliament of Religions took place in connection with the World's Fair. And there, for the first time in modern history, some would say, for the first time ever, representatives of the world's religions gathered. Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Protestants, Catholics, Jews. It was a global event, a great convergence that was planned and hosted by Protestant Christians, Reformed Jews, and Unitarians. As chairman of the parliament, Presbyterian minister John Henry Barrows wrote, it was felt to be wise and advantageous that the religions of the world which are competing at so many points on all the continents should be brought together not for contention but for loving conference in one room. The organizers in 1893 sent out some 10,000 letters to various parts of the world. Who knows how the recipients were identified or the addresses found. But the invitation was cast in confident language, the language of an unmarked Christian universalism. Listen to it. It read in part, believing that God is and that he has not left himself without witnesses and convinced that God is no respecter of persons, but that in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. We affectionately invite the representatives of all faiths to aid us in presenting to the world at the exposition of 1893 the religious harmonies and unities of humanity. Now, if the invitational words sounded familiar, they actually should. They are taken straight out of St. Paul in the Acts of the Apostles. Indeed, they are a kind of Christian warrant uh, for regarding as part of God's plan the many peoples of faith throughout the world. God has not left himself without witnesses anywhere, Acts 14. In every nation, those who worketh righteousness are acceptable unto him, Acts 12, 10. So it, the language itself had this sort of unmarked uh, Christian vision to it. Uh, I don't think it was offensive or even noticed by the Hindus or the Buddhists who received it. There were rebuffs to the invitation, however, one from the Archbishop of Canterbury who declined to attend because, as he put it, the Christian religion is the only true religion, and a Hong Kong missionary who wrote accusing the organizers of, quote, playing fast and loose with the truth and coquetting with false religions. The headline in the Chicago Tribune in September 16, 1893, would have confirmed his suspicions. It read, Wells of Truth Outside. It announced the realization, for some a blasphemy, that there was indeed religious truth, perhaps deep wells of it, outside the Christian tradition. Now, for our standpoint today, the predominant spirit of the 1893 parliament was a kind of welcoming universalism on the part of the largely Christian hosts. The spirit of universalism looking toward a transcendent unity of religion was the zeitgeist of the time. It was in the air in the late 19th century. And when one of our first Gifford lecturers, Max Mueller, found that he was unable to come to the parliament, he wrote enthusiastically in his letter of response, the living kernel of religion can be found, I believe, in almost every creed, however much the husk may vary. And think what that means. It means that above and beneath and behind all the religions, there is one eternal, one universal religion. This kind of universalistic vision was reiterated in many ways, in many keys throughout the parliament. Barrows himself echoed this view. <clears throat> Religion, he said, like the white light of heaven, has been broken into many color colored fragments. Has been broken into many colored fragments by the prisms of men. Out of the many and one of the many objects of the Parliament of Religions has been to change this many-colored radiance back into the white light of heavenly truth. Those who flocked to the Parliament to fill the halls also heard this very vision proclaimed by Swami Vivekananda, the elegant, robed, and turbaned Swami from India, hitherto unknown in India itself, really, who seemed eloquently to enunciate this universal spirit. He spoke of Hinduism as the religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. For many, 
It was the first time they had ever heard a Hindu speak in his own voice, and the room erupted in thunderous applause. Then they heard Rabbi Emil Hirsch of Chicago proclaim, the day of national religions is past. The God of the universe speaks to all mankind. He is not the God of Israel alone. The Jordan and the Ganges, the Tiber and the Euphrates hold water wherewith the devout may be baptized unto his service and redemption. Every day the assembly recited the Lord's Prayer as what was called a universal prayer. And on the final day, Rabbi Hirsch led the prayer. So as we explore the age of pluralism, we should take clear note that for many at the parliament, the universal ingathering of religions was really a kind of extension of a Christian universal. Chairman Barrows addressed the gathering assembly as children of the one God and asked, why should not Christians be glad to learn what God has wrought through Buddha and Zoroaster, through the sages of China and the prophets of India and the prophet of Islam? While Barrows truly believed that they were all there as members of a parliament over which flies no sectarian flag, it's clear that his very conception of the universal was but a larger and more expansive version of Christianity. And frankly, perhaps as a first initiative in this kind of interfaith encounter, it could not have been otherwise, given what they knew in Chicago in 1893. At the closing session, Chicago lawyer Charles Bonney, one of the parliament's chief visionaries, declared, henceforth the religions of the world will make war not on each other, but on the giant evils that afflict mankind. Let's put aside for the moment that this vision of evolving comity among the people of different religious traditions was so deeply disappointed in the century that followed. Of course, there were many ways in which the interfaith movement, as we know it today, does have its roots in the parliament. Britain's own Marcus Braybrook has carefully put together the history of the fits and starts that came to mark the 20th century experiments with interfaith understanding. And we'll say more of this in the lectures to come. But on the face of it, most people who are not tracking the interfaith movement and not participating in it see little evidence for a cooperative religious alliance against the ills of the world in the 20th century. Indeed, the past 100 years seems to have provided ample evidence that the powerful producers of the symbolic weaponry for the strife of humankind are very often our religious traditions. Now let's fast forward 100 years to 1993, the Parliament of the World's Religions, the centennial event that also took place in Chicago. And if the zeitgeist of 1893 was universalism, all the faiths gathering under the great umbrella of one God, the spirit of 93 was very different, growing from the very diversity of a new Chicago. It came nearly three decades into what we in America now call the new immigration. The 1965 Immigration and Nationalities Act, as you may recall, had eliminated the restrictive Asian immigration and opened the door for immigration once again. People came to the US from all over the world. And they came not only with their dreams of freedom or their economic uh, dreams of opportunity and wealth, but also with their Bhagavad Gita's and their Qurans and their images of the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin and of the Virgin of Guadalupe. They rented halls in storefronts for Friday Islamic prayers. They gathered in homes for Hindu festivals. And as they settled into neighborhoods and suburbs, they contended with zoning boards and city councils, with skeptical neighbors and court challenges to build those big new Islamic centers and Hindu temples that are now part of our American landscape. In Chicago, Hindu immigrants built the huge Sri Venkateshwara temple in Aurora, in one of the suburbs. They built the Sri Ram temple in Lamont. Jains built a flagship uh, temple in Bartlett, and Sikhs a beautiful Gurdwara in Palatine, a Zoroastrian center in Hinsdale. Across the face of Chicago, uh, Islamic centers, Islamic schools, Chinese, Lao, Vietnamese, immigrant Buddhist centers, the whole panoply. And as the centennial for a parliament 
began to be planned, people in Chicago looked around and said, you know, the basic elements of a parliament are already here. We just don't know each other. And so it began. Before long, there were 14 host committees, not only Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish, but Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, Jain, Zoroastrian. They were the inviters. While previously people from religious traditions around the world had been the exotic guests of other lands and faith, by 1993, they were the hosts, Chicago Hindus and Muslims inviting their co-religionists to Chicago. And that gathering was eye-opening for America. It was the first major public manifestation of what I call the new religious America. And the opening ceremonies included the cymbals and drums and polyphonic chanting of the Drepung Luzling Tibetan monks. And Native Americans blessed the four directions with smoking sage. It was not only about what happened in America, but also about networks of connection that had by this time linked religious communities in America to religious communities around the world. In the Parliament Halls of Chicago in 1993, there was a level of encounter no longer dominated by a single worldview. It was a rough-hewn kind of pluralism. It was clear that the global is not the universal, but is richly diverse, unlikely to be subsumed under anybody's flag or canopy. It was as polycentric as the world. It was a fair with displays and pamphlets and dances and prayers. There were panels and discussions, face-to-face -face encounters on urgent global issues, Kashmir, human rights, the rights of indigenous people. Gone was the presupposition that we're all basically the same, that behind all religion there is one universal religion. 1993. Now let's fast forward again to today, 2009. That was only 16 years ago in real time, but in another sense it was one huge revolution ago. When the book Megatrends 2000 came out in 1991, it was touted as the visionary book that would carry us into the 21st century. There was mention of the new religious reality of America we had been starting to describe in the Pluralism Project. I could even find my name in the index, but one word that was absent from the index and from the book itself was the word internet. The book pointed to fiber optic cables that could in in increasingly bear tens of thousands of simultaneous phone conversations around the world, and that was extraordinary enough. But even in 1993, the internet was not fully in view. In 1994, Netscape was founded, and Netscape Navigator became the first popularly available web browser. In 1996, Google revolutionized the search engine with a simple box into which you could type a subject, any subject. By 2006, there were 92 million domain names. And by 2007, more than a billion users of the internet. As we think about globalization now, even 1993, the year before this all came about, seems somehow distant. These years have meant the creation of increasingly networked societies and a networked world. This is a revolution of communications like that of 16th century Europe with the use of the printing press. The world of the internet is one in which boundaries are superseded, and that includes not only national boundaries, but religious and dogmatic boundaries as well. We have witnessed this era of economic globalization in our own time. We know about it, the banks, the markets, we've all seen it in the last few months. Powerful telecommunications networks deploy worldwide advertising strategies. They create worldwide markets. Boston's Dunkin' Donuts coffee shop sells coffee in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, and Oshkosh Bagash sells children's clothing in a skyscraper in Kuala Lumpur. There are Italian fashions in Singapore, and Tata Industries make steel here in Britain. And all this driven by free market capitalism and what Thomas Friedman calls the inexorable integration of markets, nation states, and technologies to a degree never witnessed before. Most of us here have also lived through the 
increasing globalization of communications. Today, there are worldwide news brokers, CNN, Al Jazeera, BBC, all bringing their respective versions of the news to the entire world. I can read the Times of London here in Edinburgh, lock, looking right out on Charlotte Square. Uh, Brazilian soap operas are broadcast in Turkey. American primetime sitcoms, some of the most awful things, are broadcast in rural Egypt and South India and bring a vision of me and my country to people I don't even know. And the walls of our museums have fallen. The works of the National Gallery in London are visible to students in Argentina. And through the internet, a student here in Edinburgh can access the entire Buddhist canon in Chinese, Tibetan, and Pali. This communication revolution means that we, and I put that in quotes, we can, as Friedman puts it, see through, hear through, look through almost every conceivable wall. We can know so much about each other. With lightning speed, we can communicate our lives, our hopes, our hatreds, our prejudices. And we're just beginning to awaken to the religious and ethical dimensions of global communications and the ways in which it shapes and has reshaped our consciousness. This is a challenge all of us face. Horrors are digitized, amplified, and multiplied. The snapshots taken in Abu Ghraib prison, the bus blown up in Jerusalem, the row of dead children in Gaza, starvation in Darfur. Everyone sees these images, and they deeply affect our moral imagination. On the other hand, there is much that we don't see. The connections, the hands clasped, the understandings reached, the friendships forged across chasms of difference. Rarely are they newsworthy, and they are, for the most part, publicly invisible. When an American fundamentalist preacher like Franklin Graham makes derisive or ignorant comments about Islam, it's on the next day's newspapers in Jakarta. The inflammatory words of a Muslim preacher in Cairo will be picked up and amplified to fuel the very worst fears of Israeli and American Jews. Cartoons published in Denmark become the flashpoint of international controversy. In this world, no one speaks in private. The opportunities for distortion, misunderstanding, and the amplification of prejudice are many. And there is no international regulatory commission to contain the distortions, contextualize the horrors, balance each bomb attack with a countervailing story of uh, goodwill and human creativity and connection. But the good news is that those stories are there. There are also hundreds of stories of creativity and connection. A Methodist church and a mosque in Fremont, California, buy property together, break ground for a new church and a new Islamic center side by side, live together for some 10 years now. Mormons and Muslims in Salt Lake City send cargo planes together with supplies for the uh, tsunami-stricken Indonesia. These things do not make the international news, but it puts on the ground the kind of connections that are prognostic for our future. Also, somewhat on the positive side, is the fact that the voices and visions of religious communities are also part of the worldwide communications revolution. After centuries, think of it, after centuries of relying on the interpretation and misinterpretation of others, religious communities can represent themselves to others and to the public. The Jamaati Islami in India and Pakistan packages its Islamic views for the English language internet. You can read about it. So does the worldwide Hindu organization called the Vishwa Hindu Parishad that links diaspora Hindu communities in America and perhaps in Britain to the projects that they have in India and the politics that they have in India. The Taiwan-based Fokuang movement of Buddhist humanism, called the International Buddhist Progress Society, links a network now of more than 50 huge Buddhist temples around the world, from Dallas and Denver to South Africa and Amsterdam. Even the World Council of Churches uh, communicates its projects now via the internet to member churches in 110 countries. And of course, the YouTube of the Vatican 
Pope Benedict gave a very clear rationale for why this was important when he launched it earlier this year. He said, so that the church and its message continue to be present in the great Areopagus of social communications, and so that the church is not a stranger to those places where young people search for answers and meaning in their lives. So he told them, you must find new ways to spread the voices and images of hope through the ever-evolving communication system that surrounds our planet. It's very astute, very important. And for those young people, this Areopagus of communication works for everyone. They might start out looking for the Vatican website and just as well find the Dalai Lama or Thich Nhat Hanh or any one of a hundred spiritual leaders whose talks and dialogues have made it to YouTube. They might find the fetwas of Osama bin Laden or the inspirational videos of the Interfaith Youth Corps. Certainly from the standpoint of the US, nothing has more powerfully demonstrated this new world situation than the catastrophes of September the 11th. In villages with a single TV in parts of the world where literally New York in rural India is just a word, people saw the towers collapse. And they saw the face of Osama bin Laden delivering his message sent by a foot messenger from, from the hills to Al Jazeera and broadcast to every television set in the world. Within hours of that, I had received messages and email statements from a dozen Islamic organizations in the United States and around the world. Most of them never heard by anyone uh, but statements of condemnation of the attacks. Over the next day, I could see citizens lighting candles along Shantipat at the heart of New Delhi, or Buddhists uh, having candles around the rim of the Borobudur stupa in Java. At the Pluralism Project, we read accounts of the attacks on Muslim uh, companies, book, a bookstore in Virginia, for example, a firebomb at a mosque in Texas, rifle shots through the dome of a mosque in Toledo. We saw the countervailing response as well as 2,000 citizens of Toledo came out to join hands in a human circle around the mosque. And we gathered local newspaper accounts of the many, many open houses that were held in Islamic centers to invite in neighbors who did not know them. As one Presbyterian put it, visiting a mosque in Texas for the first time, you know, the time of not getting to know each other is over. That fall, during the festival of Sukkot, our Jewish neighbors at Harvard built their sukkah, a makeshift shelter of branches and leaves, covered but open to the sky and to the wind, remembering the wilderness experience of the Hebrew people. And that fall in 2001, the theologian Arthur Waskow wrote, this year, the ancient truth came home to us. We all live in a sukkah. Even the greatest oceans do not shield us. Even the mightiest buildings don't shield us. Even the wealthiest balance sheets and the most powerful weapons do not shield us. They are only wispy walls and leaky roofs. And then there are the deep ethical issues that globalization and the counter-globalization movements have made evident. So powerful is this communication technology that the great digital divide between those who do and don't have access to it is enormous. Globalization, as we know, has its own exclusions. We know through our images of the villages in Afghanistan and the madrasas in Peshawar how very few in the human family have a share in the economic benefits of globalization how few have the educational privilege that my own students take for granted in roaming the world through the medium of modern communications and learning about places and people near and far. As the Human Development Report of the UN put it, the collapse of space, time, and borders may be the creation of a global village, but not everyone can be a global citizen. The report documents that the wealthiest 20% of the world control 86% of the world's wealth. The rest are left out altogether. I could access this report on my computer, for we in the United States own more computers than the rest of the world combined. I could print it out, and I'm afraid I did, for we in the richest 20% consume 84% of the world's paper. So how do we think about the ethical dimensions of this global revolution? How does it shape and reshape our religious life? 
These are all religious issues. Has communications now become the bearer of a new kind of Orientalism, a new kind of cyber globalism, a new order of domination based on rapid access to information? Former UN Special Envoy Sergei Viero de Mello, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who was killed, as you know, in Iraq in 2003, put it this way. These problems are not fundamentally new. Human beings have lived with war, disease, and equality, inequality for centuries. What is different today is that we have no excuse to be unaware of the divide between the world's rich and poor, powerful and powerless, included and marginalized. The Buddhist philosopher and teacher Thich Nhat Hanh describes this world as one of interbeing, Everything is interrelated. The paper on which my text is printed is dependent on and related to the sunshine and rain it could to grow the trees from which it was produced and the labor and machinery that produced it and the forms of commerce that marketed it. And all of this is a kind of classic Buddhist observation, but he puts it in modern and practical language. We inter-are. We do not exist in and for ourselves. And I'll come back to him next week as well. For religious people in all traditions, refining our awareness of interbeing, of interdependence, is certainly one of the great religious tasks of our time, whether we're Christians, Muslims, or Jews. We all have this challenge before us. We do not live in a world alone, unaffected by the presence and power of the other. For those of us who are scholars of religion, refining our analysis of the ways in which globalization is reshaping the religious energies of our world is one of the most important challenges in the humanities. Studying religion is not only increasingly important, but increasingly difficult. And I believe it will require the very best of our students, the ones who go into neuroscience and cancer research, the ones who know the workings of the inside of a computer or know where cyberspace is. Those students, we need them because our scientific and technological achievements span the globe, but we have not yet developed the religious literacy to understand the people who, whom, with whom we share the globe. We haven't learned their languages, and we have not learned the languages of inspiration and transcendence that animate them. As the Aga Khan recently put it, we have not so much a clash of civilizations, but a clash of ignorance. Our ability to think in new ways will challenge us on all fronts in the age of pluralism. As scholars, we're challenged to understand the swift currents of a global world with its complex interfaith encounters. We need to understand what is necessary to address the clash of ignorance. As citizens of nations and cities, we're challenged to develop what Robert uh, Putnam has called the bridging capital that we need to build the multicultural and multi-religious societies of today. And as people of faith, we're also challenged to think deeply and anew about the resources of our own tradition as we encounter the religious other. These are questions of scholarship, they're questions of citizenship, and they're questions of faith. And they are all our questions in the age of pluralism. Thank you very much. You, you gave us a very eloquent um, depiction of the, the growing religious diversity in the United States and all of these things that are going on at the ground. But the, the image that many people have of our country, particularly after 2001, was of a, of a, of a resurgence of a, of a fundamentalist uh, evangelical Christianity. And I was wondering if, if you could comment at all about, uh, about that world image of, of the United States and this, this, this fundamentalism and the culture wars and, and the sort of other reality that you were describing existing on the ground of, of yeah. interfaith 
uh, cooperation and, and understanding. Well, I won't say that everything on the ground is by way of interfaith <laughs> cooperation and understanding. There is, there is a lot of that. But certainly, uh, the, the image of a Christian America and even the argument over a Christian America is a very, very powerful one. I mean, you know, a, a, among our great culture wars, and I, I would say just a word about these tomorrow, the, you know, the big argument over whether we can post the Ten Commandments in public places uh, we hardly ever post them in churches, mind you, but you know we want to have them in the courthouse. Um, the issues about prayer in school and all the things that prayer before football games, etc, all of the things that have become sort of flash cultural issues for what we have called the Christian right. And it is true that the evangelical Christian church has grown in the United States considerably over the last 20 plus years. It also is increasingly diverse, and the, the sort of strident Christian America folks know that, in fact, they don't have much of a constitutional argument. We do have a, uh, a constitution that does not provide for a, uh, an established religion. But they have really claimed a kind of de facto establishment over the last uh, 20 or 30 years that's beginning to break apart. And I think uh, the sort of recasting of the image of America, what Barack Obama called our patchwork people, uh, it is something that, is, that will increasingly uh, diffuse that image. But I know that when I went on a uh, uh, mission with the State Department to Indonesia, one of the reasons they wanted people to, to have an Indonesian translation of my book on New Religious America was that there was just none of this knowledge of the fact that there are uh, many, many Islamic communities in the United States, Islamic advocacy groups, lots of you know, Muslim energy, to say nothing of, of the Buddhists and the rest. So I think that image issue is a huge one. Uh, yes, I think, uh, yeah, there. Um, thank you very much for that first lecture. I look thank forward you. to hearing the other ones. Um, you left us thinking about the need to develop uh, a language, a way of understanding religion in the future and maybe needing our best minds to apply themselves to that task. I, I just wondered if you could say who is doing that and I'm particularly want, wanting to your opinion about the work of people like Ken Wilbur. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know his work, but I've got a few people who keep telling me he's mm -hmm. doing this kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, and developing a kind of integral spirituality and a, if you like, a theory of everything, which is really a theory of everything. So I, I just wonder if you could guide us about who the... I can't who, say much about Ken Wilber himself, though I do uh, am more or less aware of his, of his work um, and have read some of his early things. But, and he is someone who actually does reach a very wide audience, and that's important. I think, uh, I mean, there are two things. We need, we need many, many more people who are religiously literate. Let's just put it that way. And uh, in the United States, at least, we have departments for the study of religion in virtually every major university. And in some cases, I think we could say that the number of religion majors is growing. More people are understanding that they need this knowledge in order to navigate in the world. Um, but uh, we actually do not attract really the very best students to the study of religion. I wish we did. And there are many, more, many places in the world that are teeming with religious life that don't have academic studies of religion at all. I mean, I think of uh, India, for example, where you can study Islam if, you're, if you go to Aligarh Muslim University or to one of, the, uh, one of the great Muslim academies. And if you're Muslim, that would make sense to people. Or if you're Hindu, go to Banaras Hindu University and study in, in the philosophy department or the department of Indology. The idea that someone would t deliberately study someone else's religion is really uh, almost unheard of in many parts of the world. And so this is, a, this is a huge challenge. And I have to say that among our undergraduates, at least at Harvard, we do have really superb students. And not all of them go into religion. They, you know, they go into medicine and other things as well. But I, I just take this as a, as a personal challenge, that this is, uh, this is a real criti a critical issue for the world. Yeah, um... Professor Northcott in the front here, please.
Thank you very much, Professor Eck, for a really wonderful tour d'horizon in your first lecture. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the Archbishop of Canterbury was viciously attacked in the journal called The Spectator for his involvement in uh, an ongoing series of seminars called Building Bridges, which I attended in Singapore in 2007. Oh. And they, they were actually begun by George Carey, his predecessor mm -hmm. after 9-11 as a response to it. Um, the same article by a, a quite prominent BBC producer um, attacked the Bishop of Oxford, uh, John Pritchard, for defending the right of a, of a mosque to uh, propose broadcasting the call to prayer in an Oxford suburb. And the, uh, but the article went beyond viciousness in suggesting that these bishops are, are actually part of the cultural collapse of Christianity in Britain. Uh, in the extent to which they are prepared to um, engage um, and even, um, rather more than engage, welcome um, mm -hmm. uh, Islamic witness, Islamic mm -hmm. presence uh, in this country and pointed out that um, in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, in the Muslim parts of Nigeria, in the Sudan, the list goes on and on, uh, Christians not only would not find a similar welcome, but are quite the contrary, are frequently persecuted, burned mm -hmm. out of their homes, killed even while at worship. Um, so uh, he was suggesting that really this was, this was part of a kind of sad decay of uh, Christian civilization and Christian Britain, and at best perhaps the realization of a kind of Hegelian vision of Christianity mm -hmm. as finally working itself out into the, in the form of a secular civilization, but not something to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. I, I want to see the articles because th this argument, of course, has been made other places as well. That the the, en the entry into sort of deep dialogue with other faiths, but let's say Islam in particular, since that's the most salient in our time, um, is really a, a sign of weakness. Now, you know, the truth is, I think the Christian Church, insofar as it has begun to stagger in various places. Uh, did so long before it uh, developed an outreach to other faiths. And for many people, and I say this in relation to young people that I know, the sign of vitality of Christianity is really that it is engaged with the world and the world of other faiths. I mean, for students at Oxford, I'm afraid, and uh, I, I mean, I think that would probably be the case. I don't, may not be as true for their parents, but the relation of Muslims and Christians is not something that is uh, sort of theoretical. Uh, this is the sea they swim in. This is the world they live in. And that's certainly true in the universities in the United States. Um, their parents sometimes have to be convinced that this is not abandoning the gospel if they're Christian. But for students themselves, this is the level of engagement with people that, uh, that is taken for granted. And there's no way they can uh, sort of dig in uh, uh, through the trenches and isolate themselves uh, theologically from relation with others. So uh, I don't know how, you know how this will play out in, in Britain. I don't think that uh, the model presented by many Muslim countries where the Christian uh, is not welcomed and indeed persecuted is one that we can sort of uh, make as a parallel to uh, how it should be for us. Uh, I mean, the place that I see the strongest sign is in the Amman Declaration, the uh, group of Muslim leaders literally from across the world uh, and from a whole spectrum of Shia and Sunni and the, all of the various schools of Islamic law who not only came together in a kind of ecumenical declaration in Amman, Jordan, but then issued this uh, invitation, so to speak, a common word between us and you to Christian churches to come together around the things we most deeply share, the uh, love of God and love of neighbor. Now, to me, that is a really hopeful sign because all of those Muslim leaders are not people who are known to be uh, you know, welcoming Western Muslims by any shot, but are people who do have influence in the wider Muslim world. So I think uh, my own feeling is we've got to bank on, the, on that side of it. Um, and uh, I may be an eternal optimist, but I think it's the age of pluralis pluralism, even if you reject it. And th there are its rejectors, to be sure. <laughs>
question, yes. Margaret Mackay, Celtic and Scottish Studies here at the University of Edinburgh. I'd like to join the others first in thanking you very, very much for uh, uh, a lecture which has uh, got this series off to such a splendid start. I know we're all looking forward to the whole series. Um, I was delighted at what you said about Diwali and Bozeman, um, uh, partly because uh, in my department uh, you can read a student project about Diwali in Inverness. Oh, really? and, um, <laughs> How interesting. <yeah. laughs> and uh, uh, I hope that while you're here in Edinburgh and in Scotland, you'll have a chance to see how, in a way, we have a kind of microcosm of what you've described in the United States. That we, we're a very pluralist society now here, too, in religious terms. And from an ethnological point of view, uh, uh, looking at the expression, religious expression, and, and so on, from a folkloristic and a, a, a cultural point of view, uh, this is the kind of thing that we have... have uh, uh, begun to explore here very fruitfully. Uh, I'd like to follow on uh, uh, from an earlier question in asking you about your team at, at Harvard. And my question was, to what extent are members of the research team that you are working with in this project, which I'm looking forward to hearing much more about uh, themselves from a, a range of religious backgrounds? They, absolutely, they are. We've had, from the beginning, Muslim students, Hindu students, Sikh students, uh, a few, a Buddhist webmaster and a few other Buddhist students. One of our uh, uh, associate directors for a time was, um, was no longer working with us now, but was pagan and very much a leader in a uh, Wiccan circle in Cambridge. So I think religiously they have had a good deal of diversity. We haven't necessarily hired them for that reason, but uh, it, in some cases we have wanted to have students who really had the language skills to um, work in Gujarati communities, for example, or uh, Tamil-speaking communities. And the other thing is I think they're drawn to this work. I mean, now we have a tiny bit of new funding, so we can actually pay some uh, research interns this coming summer. But for the last three summers, we didn't have any money. And even so, we had a flock of students. I mean, 75 students who submitted applications to work with us for free. We could only take maybe 10 of them. But uh, the idea that students really want to do this kind of work is, to me, encouraging. And most of it is students. We do have research affiliates in other universities, and they, too, do it as a sort of pedagogical issue to work with their students. There was a questioner in, in the back who's been very patient. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor. I, I'm from Indonesia. I'm now studying at University of Edinburgh. You mentioned my country a lot, but also you mentioned about the need for religious literacy. But I just wonder if you can locate the, the atheist group or even the agnostic within this interfaith dialogue that you propose. Because basically, I think that's part of the diversity too. And mm -hmm. also yes. the number are significant. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I haven't heard you mentioning about this, this group of people. Thank you Thank for you. that question. I, I, I sort of had them in mind when I spoke of the, uh, the ardent secularist. But it is very true that those who are atheists are, have a significant voice in the societies that all of us live in. Um, although I think in Indonesia, if you're an atheist, you still have to put one religious community or another down on your, uh, on your ID card. It's not a, a, a government option to be an atheist. But, um, but on the whole, I mean, atheists are you know, important participants. And as I said, even if you're an atheist in a British society, and you've got some very famous atheists here, um, you still are a co-citizen in a society in which there are lots of Muslims and, uh, and Christians and Jews and others. So it's not as if by being an atheist you wash your hands of the problem of the age of uh, pluralism, because that too is part of it. I will say also that we, on our website in uh, the Pluralism Project, if you go to it, pluralism.org, we, about five years ago, set one of our students, a young man from Dartmouth College, to doing research on atheism and atheist organizations because the atheists didn't have a, 
a, a sort of button on the website. And all, everyone else had a button, even though you realized that once you pushed the Christian button, there was all sorts of arguments underneath it. But still, uh, we, so we did a, a whole entry for atheists, because there are atheist organizations, and quite a few of them. But I think it is important, so thank you for mentioning that. I think we can take one more question, Dr. Openshaw. In, uh, no, in the, in, in the front here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I joined the chorus, and thank you for the lecture. I'm Jeanne Openshaw, and I teach here of traditions from an anthropological Wonderful. perspective in uh, the University of Edinburgh. And I was interested in connecting your work in India and your present focus on pluralism. I was wondering how so-called Hinduism, which, as you know, uh, do more characterized as including but hierarchizing, yes. fell into your category of inclusivism, which you seem to rather dismiss, or rather into pluralism. It's a very good question. <laughs> I'm always struggling with this question. I think it is a kind of hierarchical pluralism, as you say. I mean, there is a way in which um, there is the deep sense that there are plural paths. There are many gods, many expressions of each and every god, many uh, sampradayas or religious uh, movements or sects. Um, on the other hand, so from a, a, a theological point of view, it has a, a wide pluralism. From a social point of view, it's very hierarchical. So a pluralism on the ground, so to speak, is uh, disrupted to a great extent by the fact of caste. And, um, and there also is a sense that, uh, that Hindu, Hindu pluralism is a kind of inclusivistic pluralism. <laughs> that uh, you know, even if you're a Muslim, in India, from a Hindu point of view, your path is just one of the many paths. And of course, that's not my identity as a Muslim. So this is a real problem. I want to talk more with you about this, because I think, uh, I don't actually think that the pluralism, inclusivism, exclusivism way of talking about societies is, is at all adequate. I mean, it's one way of, of sort of uh, slicing it. But India has its own uh, peculiarities. I will say one other thing about my, the relation of my work in India to my work here in, or, or in the United States. And that is that for some reason, as a, as a daughter of an architect and someone who grew up in the Wild West, I'm very interested in space and place. And so a lot of my most recent work in India has been about pilgrimage and networks of pilgrimage and sacred places and that that's just finished it won't be out for another year or so but that's kind of when I look at it what I started doing in the United States as well which is to do a kind of mapping of uh, of religious traditions as they began to emerge in the American context so I look forward to meeting you I think we can take the one more question from the gentleman be, be just behind you Thanks. Um, I was just wondering if the forum that lady was talking about, uh, the existence of, of, of uh, agnostics, is uh, does the Pluralism Project recognize the notion of a civil religion active in America? And if so, how does it actually monitor and measure such a phenomenon? Of civil religion? Yes. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, actually, because uh, civil religion means a lot of things. But it, of course, it, it is true that when people look at America, they say, you know, you don't really have an established religion, and yet you're always praying in public. And, you know, you have prayers at the inauguration and, uh, and prayers at the beginning of city council meetings and at the legislatures and that sort of thing. How does that figure? And so there is, I think, a very strong stream of civil religion in the U.S. We... I mean, yeah, we, we study it because it's certainly part of the mix, but uh, it's something that I think we need to do much more work on. It, it has to do with how we s ritualize our civil society in a deeply religious context in which we're not all the same. And we do that increasingly in a pluralistic way. 
So you look at the inaugural um, sort of service that was held at the inauguration of Barack Obama. This was in the National Cathedral, which is an Episcopalian cathedral in Washington. And in the procession, there's my friend Uma Mysorekar from the Hindu temple, the Ganesh Hindu temple in Queens, and she had a word to say, and the woman who's head of the Islamic Society of North America, and she had a role, and Muslims, both African American and, uh, and immigrant Muslims. This is sort of a new transformation of our civil religion. Time of, of not getting to know each other is over. I like that phrase. Uh, Professor Eck, you've given us an extremely eloquent, highly informed, and engaging first Gifford lecture, noting that this is a new world for all of us, a new world defined by the twin revolutions of the massive migrations of people and the internet and communications revolutions so that religious encounter is now pervasive for all of us. We look forward to the rest of the series. The next lecture will be tomorrow evening at the same time, 5.30, here in the same place, the St. Cecilia's Hall, when Professor Eck will address us on the civic perspective, citizens, nations, and the challenges of religious pluralism. Now, again, there will be a reception just after we finish, but could you join me once more in expressing our appreciation both for the lecture and for the questions. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.